Dunda! 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 Remix 17 soar over the vast jungles of Southeast Asia. Below, a United States Air Force Cessna O2A Super Skymaster flies low over the treetops. The mix can't see the O2, but they know it is somewhere below them. The MiG-17 fresco was the most numerous of the three MiGs encountered by United States Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps air crews over North Vietnam. Armed with a 37mm and two 23mm cannons, it was an agile opponent with limited air-to-ground capabilities. The two other MiGs of the North Vietnamese People's Air Force included MiG-21 Fishbeds and later MiG-19 Farmers. American aviators also encountered People's Liberation Army Air Force J-5s and J-6s. Chinese domestically produced versions of the MiG-17 and MiG-19 based at a Chinese-occupied Hainan Island. Suddenly, the radio in the O2 crackles to life. Billy Curry, this is Dalton Lead. I have a gun below. Can you mark? We will destroy. Dalton Lead, this is Tilly. Stand by for marking. The MiG-17s orbiting the O2 are not North Vietnamese, but Khmer Air Force MiG-17s combating the indigenous communist Khmer Rouge along with the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese forces that have violated Cambodian borders, and stored equipment along the infamous Ho Chi Minh Trail that was used to provide supplies to Viet Cong guerrillas operating in South Vietnam. It is January 1971, and First Lieutenant Richard Bryan is a 28-year-old United States Air Force pilot of the 19th Tactical Air Support Squadron, referred to as TAS. The 19th TAS was one of the oldest United States Air Force units conducting continuous operations in Southeast Asia, beginning in 1963 flying O-1E bird dogs out of Benoit, outside Saigon, directing airstrikes and close air support missions to assist ground troops across South Vietnam. In 1968, the 19th TAS transitioned to the O2A Super Skymaster and North American Rockwell OV-10 Bronco. Richard Bryan was born and raised in Rochester, New York. After high school, he planned to attend medical school at the University of Dayton in Ohio, but couldn't afford the tuition. He took a job at Kodak located in his hometown, working on the factory floor. During that time, he attended State University of New York Brockport, was married, had a son, and graduated. He continued working at Kodak, but being the only one on the factory floor with a degree, he wanted something more for his young family. In 1968, the United States was heavily involved in the Vietnam War. Richard Bryan, as a married man, and now a father of two, was exempt from the draft and military service. But he felt compelled to serve his country. He talked to an Air Force recruiter about flying and waited to hear back. As the weeks went by, he heard nothing, so he thought about trying a different branch. He traveled to New York City to interview with the Navy and the possibility of attending their flight school, but failed the eye test. Upon returning home to Rochester, a letter was waiting for him from the United States Air Force permitting his entry to officer training school at Lackland Air Force Base, Texas and flight school upon graduation. At the end of 1968, Richard Bryan completed officer training school and was commissioned a second lieutenant and was ready to see the world with his family. They moved from upstate New York to Lubbock, Texas in early January 1969 where he conducted his initial and primary flight training at Reese Air Force Base over 51 weeks. Having flown the Cessna T-41 Mascalero, Cessna T-37 Tweet, and Northrop T-38 Talon. Yeah. 
Upon completion of primary flight training, he moved to Hurlburt Field, Florida to begin learning his assigned airframe, the Cessna O2A Super Skymaster. After O2A training, he knew he would be going to Vietnam. Brian picked up his family and moved them back to Rochester, as he attended survival school during the bitter cold spring of 1970 at Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington. After completing the training, he saw his family a final time before departing for a conflict half a world away in Southeast Asia. There was one final training before entering the war zone, Jungle Survival School at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, affectionately referred to by all that attended as Snake School. In May of 1970, Lieutenant Richard Bryan stepped off a Lockheed C-141 Starlifter into the blistering heat, humidity, and cacophony of artillery at Cameron Bay Air Base, South Vietnam. A week later, he was transported from the coast to his new squadron, the 19th TAS, at Binwa Air Base, just outside Saigon. Within days of arriving, he was sent out on his first flight. The reality and fragility of the situation weighed heavily upon him as he realized he was alone flying an aircraft in an active war zone. Over the months, Lieutenant Bryan continued to perform his mission as a forward air controller in and around Saigon, assisting ground forces and performing reconnaissance. He had heard rumors and stories from pilots in the squadron conducting missions further south and to the west around the Mekong Delta and Cambodia. Bryan wanted to get involved in those missions. Fortunately, he was able to assist a captain serving as an air liaison officer. The captain promised that if Lieutenant Bryan helped him with administrative paperwork, he'd see what he could do and secure him a slot flying missions down in the Delta in Cambodia. Weeks later, now First Lieutenant Bryan was flying missions out of Ben Thuy, a contingent airfield operated by the South Vietnamese, just outside the city of Canto, 100 miles southwest of Saigon. Typically, he would fly out of Ben Hoa and spend a couple days in Ben Thuy before returning. He recalled it was always spotty flying out of Binh Thuy because he never knew if the base would be overrun by the Viet Cong or abandoned by the South Vietnamese. Each flight out of Binh Thuy, he made sure to watch his fuel so he would have enough to return to Binh Hoa. When he started flying missions in support of Cambodian forces, he would typically fly with a Cambodian army liaison or an American serviceman who was fluent in French that served as an interpreter. The majority of Cambodians were bilingual, speaking their native Khmer and French. Cambodia having been a French colony 17 years earlier. If a target was spotted, Brian would coordinate with the liaison or interpreter and call the United States Air Force A-37s, F-100s, or F-4s to expend whatever munitions they had on the targets, whether it was iron bombs, napalm, rockets, or cluster bombs. A common combination being snake and nape. The Cambodian military had been combating the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong for over a decade with limited support provided by the embryonic Khmer Air Force, known internally as the Aviation Nationale Khmer, or AVNK for short. The Khmer Air Force contained an eclectic assortment of aircraft from across the globe. Fuga Magistairs, Alloway Helicopters, Canadian de Havilland Beavers, Soviet MiG-15 UTI 2C Trainers, MiG-17 Frescoes, and AN-2 Colts, Chinese J-5s and CJ-6s for training, and from the United States, Douglas C-47s, A-1 Sky Raiders, North American T-6 Texans, T-28 Trojans, and Cessna T-37 Tweets with further support and technical assistance provided by Australia, Israel, Japan, Yugoslavia, and West Germany, amongst a dozen other donated airframes. An O2A flies low over the jungles of Cambodia, searching for any sign of disturbed jungle or tracks that could belong to a camouflage truck. Stand by for marking. Shut. 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 
This is Tilly. Target marked. Stand by. Approach target from east and egress west. Copy, Tilly. East to west. Rolling in. Bombs away. Copy Dalton. Good hits on target. Negative, Dalton. Negative. Good hits. Let me know if you find anything else. Ellie Tilly, thank you. Leaving west. First Lieutenant Richard Bryan resumes his patrol over the vast jungles of Cambodia and back into South Vietnam. When his fuel gauge shows he has just enough to reach Binh Hoa, he turns for Binh Thuy. An hour later, he lands back at Binh Thuy and carries on with the rest of the day and evening. And the next day, and the day after, like he has the past eight months he has been in South Vietnam. Not realizing he has conducted probably one of the strangest forward air control missions of the entire war. A United States Air Force O2A's Skymaster directing Soviet-made Cambodian flowed MiG-17s against North Vietnamese forces. A week later, Lieutenant Bryan was flying another forward air control mission with a Cambodian army liaison in the right seat. He learned that a company of Viet Cong sappers had attacked the Po Jin Tong airfield outside of Nam Pinh, where the MiG-17s and majority of Khmer Air Force aircraft operated. The Viet Cong sappers threw satchel charges in the tailpipes of the MiG-17s, completely destroying them along with a number of other aircraft and facilities, further solidifying the possibility that First Lieutenant Richard Bryan was the only U.S. pilot to conduct a strike using MiGs during the Vietnam conflict. After a full one-year tour in Vietnam, having accumulated 723 combat hours in O2As, along with 16 hours in OV-10s, and an hour and a half sortie with the South Vietnamese pilot in an A-37 Dragonfly, where he did everything except drop the bombs. First Lieutenant Richard Bryan had completed his tour of duty and was ready to return stateside to his family and continue his Air Force career. Excited to see the world with his family, the next assignment was to Lubbock, Texas, Reese Air Force Base, right where he started his whole flying career. Instead of a student, he would be an instructor on Cessna T-37 tweets, teaching students the fundamentals of Air Force flying. After a year of teaching students, he was promoted a captain and took the additional duty as the wing safety officer. After months of being required to show up at 0400 to conduct his instructor duties that involved students trying to kill him in ever more creative and horrifying ways, he had to work an office job through the day and the evening. Captain Richard Bryan, exhausted, had enough of the Air Force and did not seek an additional assignment. He packed up his family and returned to Rochester, New York, where he took a sales position at Kodak. His stipulation on returning to Kodak as a salesman was that he would not be near any large city. Kodak acquiesced and moved him and his family to Central Virginia. While in Virginia, Mr. Bryan picked up flying again and obtained his private pilot's license. Into civilian life, Mr. Bryan and his family lived a quiet, peaceful life. He worked his way up through the Kodak sales team and finally used his managerial talents in a number of other companies before finally retiring to Florida.
Gashir here. I would like to explain some of the details and discrepancies encountered while creating this video. This was made using Digital Combat Simulator and a lot of mods. A couple of scenes are from IL-2 1946 Bat Mod and a lot of archival footage and photos that I try to keep consistent with the era and location. The MiG-17s used are MiG-15s. For those who play DCS, you know, and I know, and I know you know, there isn't a MiG-17. Yet. The more detail-oriented will notice that the MiGs are carrying Mark 81, 250-pound bombs instead of typical Soviet, Fab 100s, or 250s. In March of 1970, the Cambodian government and monarchy were overthrown in a coup d'etat which established the Khmer Republic. Due to changing government, the Chinese and Soviet technicians departed, and their provided assistance ended. The United States increased their material provided to fill the void. Due to lack of Soviet stockpiles of Fab 100s and 250s, the Khmer MiGs were wired to handle American Mark 81 250-pound bombs. A number of MiGs had their 23 and 37mm cannons replaced by Browning M250 caliber machine guns due to lack of spare parts. I thought it would be neat to see a MiG carrying Mark 81s, so I went into the CLSID Lua file and lines and made the changes. I tried to make everything in this as accurate as possible within my means. The O2A used in this video, Air Force serial number 11038, manufacturer serial number from Cessna 0314, was an actual O2A Super Skymaster assigned to the 19th task that crashed on 9 September 1971 when it flew into the wake turbulence of another aircraft when landing at Binh Hoa Air Base, South Vietnam. The aircraft was lost, but the pilot survived with injuries. Although in hindsight I meant to use Air Force serial number 11041, since that was the only photo of an O2A that I could find in the markings of the 19th task. I even made a livery for it. Measure once, cut twice. The 19th task used a blue panel on top of the vertical stabilizer on their O1E bird dogs and O2A Super Skymasters. On OV-10 Broncos, the front landing gear doors were painted blue. According to the FAA 11041, now November 1041, is currently owned by Del Rio Aviation at Paso Robles, California. The patch the pilot wears when walking to the O2A is a 4410th Combat Crew Training Squadron, which did the majority of the O2A training at Hurlburt Field, Florida in the late 1960s. The majority of this was filmed using the Marianas map, and it was hard trying to get the right camera angles when only having a couple spits of land that looked tropical. Inspiration for this video came from Lou Drindle's River Rats History, which is a compilation of articles from the Red River Valley Association. I purchased the book in early 2020 and was fascinated by a mission only a paragraph long with accompanying photo by Mr. Brian. I always wanted to tell this story, but there weren't any mods out there for an armed O2 capable of firing rockets. I'm sure I could have passed off the story using an O1 or an OV-10 and maybe four people would have been the wiser. But I felt the O2 deserved some more recognition outside of Bat 21. Uh, Bat 21 from Bird Dog. Uh, Bat 21, Bat 21 from Bird Dog. And Bat, oh shit! I thought I would eventually make it in IL 2 1946, but out of nowhere, PRC Cowboy showcased an O2A Super Skymaster for DCS back in December. I told him that if he released the mod, I'd make this video. I've kept my part of the deal. Thanks, cowboy. I've had a general understanding of aviation used in Vietnam, the FAC mission, and what an O2A is, or rather, Cessna 337 from the two that I've refueled during my line service days. Some planes you never forget. While there was plenty of great things to sift through, there wasn't any information I could find on Cambodian MiG FAC cooperation. One of the more interesting things I did find was Cambodian MiGs in South Vietnam weren't an unknown occurrence. While the CIA was conducting clandestine activities acquiring Syrian MiG-17s from Israel and operating them out of Groom Lake with the half ferry and half drill programs, the Cambodians were flying them around South Vietnam visiting a number of bases to include one being evaluated by the Americans at Ple Ku until it was destroyed in a Viet Cong mortar attack on 24 April 1970. I am a stickler for using correct insignias. A lot of my research was spent bouncing back and forth on which insignia was correct for January of 1971. The Roundel or the Khmer Stars and Bars? It looks like the Roundel was changed March or April of 1970, coinciding with the government changing from a monarchy to a republic. 
Although the new flag wasn't ratified until October, there are plenty of pictures of Khmer aircraft and helicopters sporting the new insignia from spring and summer of 1970. My theory is that after the Chinese and Soviet support dried up, and with more American equipment flowing in, and greater cooperation with Americans, the insignia was changed to be similar to the American and South Vietnamese insignia. The Aviation Nationale Khmer used the insignia until 1975 when the Khmer Rouge took over. I found an interview conducted by the Library of Congress with Mr. Richard Bryan, and that provided and solidified a lot of the information and assumptions I had drawn. I eventually contacted Mr. Bryan via email, and explained who I was and what I was trying to do, and if at any point he did not approve of what I was doing, I would stop. He gave his approval of the project and answered and clarified some of the questions I had, and I was ready to start making the strangest forward air control mission of the Vietnam War. Some discrepancies I couldn't overcome. I say officer training school, but the only picture I could find of officer training taking place at Lackland Air Force Base was back when OTS was still called OCS. In a couple scenes after the O2A has fired rockets, the rocket pods are full again. It was a pain getting the O2 to fire and attack the target each time, and each time it did, it would fly off in an erratic direction due to the terrain. Nothing against your mod, cowboy. I recorded the best scenes I could, and that involved the continuity error of having a full rocket pod again. Although on landing, you could see empty pods. The Vietnamese are British infantry with Lee Enfields. I went through and figured out the Lua lines, corresponding DDS files and locations, to make a new livery and dress them up as North Vietnamese, changing the British Brody helmets to look like Pith helmets. The gunshots used are from an SKS. I apologize for all the pronunciations I butchered. I was basing them off of recordings, interviews, and documentaries that I'd grown up watching and listening to. If you notice anything else wrong, or have some more knowledge to share on this topic, please leave a comment below.